Хорошо, что есть Zoom, да? Можно вот так вот. Да, да, хотя, бы, хотя бы так. Хотя, хотя бы так. так да. Хотя бы так. I request Ms. Yukta Charya to deliver the opening address. Excellencies, distinguished guests, colleagues, and friends, I'm glad to welcome all of you on behalf of Tilotama Foundation to this weekly strategic insights session, which will focus on Uzbekistan, foreign relations and role within SCO and the, in, and the context of India-Uzbekistan strategic partnership. I'm Yukta Charya. Research Associate, Tilutama Foundation. We want to acknowledge the official participation of the Embassy of Uzbekistan in India in today's session. We are honored to have the kind support and cooperation. Among us is Mr. a beautiful and geopolitically important country in Central Asia. Republic of Uzbekistan began its journey on 1st September 1991. India has historical and civilizational ties with Uzbekistan. The Consulate General of India in Tash on 7th April in 1987. Following Uzbekistan's independence, it was upgraded to the level of embassy, signing of a protocol on diplomatic and consular matters on 18th March in 1992. Multiple visits from the head of states of both countries. There is a strategic partnership between India and Uzbekistan. There is long term and really beneficial cooperation between the two sectors. The two countries in 2018 set a trade target of $1 billion by 2020. There is ongoing cooperation in information. Information and communication technologies. Both the states have agreed to cooperation, cooperation in science, technology, solar, and other forms of renewable energy. There is also bilateral cooperation in the sphere of health, medical, education, and pharmaceuticals. Tourism is another important area. Bilateral cooperation promotes people to people contacts between the two countries. The two states have mutual cooperation under the framework of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization and its regional anti-terrorist structure. The regional anti-terrorist structure of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization is headquartered in Tashkent in Uzbekistan. The two sides are also cooperating on security areas like counter-terrorism, organized crime, and human trafficking. The cooperation is strengthened in the sphere of counter-building and sharing of best practices. Along with the SCO, our ATS cooperation in this regard is also in play in multilateral forums like Eurasian Group on Combating Money Laundering and Financing of Terrorism and Forums of United Nations. The first ever India-Uzbekistan joint military exercise, the Dust Lick 2019, was held at Shishik Training Area near Tashkent in November 2019. Defense Minister of India, Sri Rajnath Singh, and Minister of Defense of Uzbekistan, Major General Bakhodir Nizamovic Kurbanov, presided over the curtain raiser of the joint military drill. Both India and Uzbekistan are part of the Ashkbad Agreement, which is crucial for connectivity and transportation. We hope for greater cooperation and synergy between the two states. We will surely have more insights from the other esteemed speakers scheduled to speak today at this session. Today's strategic insight session titled Uzbekistan, Foreign Relations and Rule Within SCO and the Context of India-Uzbekistan Strategic Partnership will be chaired by Dr. Anna Velikaya, Honorary Convener and Advisor, Russian and Central Asian Affairs to Tilutama Foundation. The entire session has been curated by Mohamdas, Director to Tilutama Foundation, I now request His Excellency, Dr. Dilshod Akhatov, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Uzbekistan to India to deliver his address.
Hello, is okay? Yeah, you're audible. Please go ahead. Dear Mr. Das, uh, dear participants uh, of today's session, uh, first of all, I would like to extend my warmest greetings uh, to all participants. Special greetings to, to my teacher, uh, Mr. Talipov, uh, teacher at the University of World Economy and Diplomacy. Uh, <laughs> If you allow me, uh, I would like to say uh, some words uh, about uh, the priorities of Uzbekistan uh, regarding the uh, Shanghai Organization of uh, Cooperation. Uh, since the creation of the uh, CS, uh, SCO in 2001, uh, Uzbekistan has viewed it as an important multilateral uh, instrument of uh, cooperation, primarily in the field of security and economy. We, uh, we believe uh, that over the past period, the SEO uh, has been um, able uh, to realize uh, many of the tasks set for itself in the security uh, sphere, especially in the field of uh, combating, uh, combating international terrorism, extremism, and separatism. Uh, the Executive Committee on the, of the Regional Anti-Terrorist Structure, RATS, uh, functioning in Tashkent, makes a great contribution to the development of practical cooperation between uh, the specialized agencies uh, of the uh, Shanghai Organization, uh, Shanghai Co Cooperation Organization, member states in this area. In uh, geopolitical terms, uh, the SCO platform uh, contributes to the uh, maintain, maintenance of strategic stability in Central Asia which is in many ways ensured by the membership of such large states as Russia, China, and India. Without uh, diminishing the achievements and role of the uh, SCO uh, in the region, in our opinion, uh, this uh, organization, uh, despite its huge potential, uh, is seriously uh, lagging, uh, uh, lagging behind in the development of uh, trade and economic cooperation. The organization has not yet been able to agree uh, on the issue of creating its own uh, financial institutions, uh, for example, the bank uh, and the development fund uh, with the help it would be possible to implement uh, specific infra infrastructure projects. Economic uh, structure <coughs> uh, remain, uh, unfortunately, uh, yet amorphous. Uh, the Business Council and uh, the, uh, the SCO Interbank Association. As a, as a result, we are <coughs> witnessing the absence um, uh, of purely SCO uh, projects in the economic sphere. Another lack uh, concerns the transport sector. The SEO uh, space, which includes the largest uh, and most dynamic part of uh, Euro-Asia, uh, hides uh, tremendous opportunities uh, for connecting international transport and trade uh, corridors uh, through the implementation of uh, SEO projects in the field of transport, transit, and connectivity. In this regard, we believe that uh, the future uh, uh, of the SCO is closely linked to the ability of the member states uh, to coordinate and implement joint uh, strategic projects in these two key areas. In addition, uh, unlocking um, the enormous uh, potential in these areas um, uh, through the implementation of agreed strategic projects has made a great contribution uh, to the sustainable development of the entire SCO uh, space in Central Asia, which is its geographical core. Uh, it is the uh, issues of trade uh, and economic uh, cooperation uh, and the implementation of large uh, transport projects that have become the um, main priorities of Uzbekistan's participation in the uh, SCO in recent years. Uh, and, uh, some words about uh, our cooperation uh, with India in, 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 in uh, framework within um, SCO. Uzbekistan and India have 
converging interests uh, in the SCO. Uh, both states are interested in stabil stabilizing Afghanistan, uh, eradicating international terrorism, extremism, creating new transport and economic corridors uh, that uh, would directly link to additional platform for promoting the India-Central uh, Asia uh, connectivity strategy. Uh, for example, Russia and China are act actively using uh, the SCO as a platform for promoting the foreign policy and economic initiatives, uh, such as Belt and Road, uh, China and the construction of greater Euro-Asia, Russia. And finally, uh, in an era of fundamental change um, in world politics and economics, uh, it is important that uh, cooperation and mutual uh, understanding prevail in the SCO space uh, than uh, rivalry. Uh, to this end, Russia, China, and India, uh, Pakistan, and Central Asia states uh, should uh, think about new ideas that would uh, give concrete answers to the questions uh, facing the organization uh, related to its future role uh, in Euro-Asian Euro affairs. Uzbekistan uh, is ready to make its, its worthy, uh, worthy uh, contribution to the formation of a new, more dynamic agenda of the SCO, which uh, will respond to world's challenges of the 20, uh, 20, uh, in, in this uh, century. Uh, thank you uh, very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Your Excellency. I now request uh, Dr. Anna Valikaya to kindly Session. Thanks a lot, uh, dear colleagues, uh, Your Excellency, Mr. Ambassador, thanks a lot uh, for your wonderful uh, speech. And now uh, we would like to welcome everyone uh, on this uh, strategic insight session, uh, Uzbekistan Foreign Relations and Role Within SCO and the context of India-Uzbekistan strategic partnership. Today, one of the key experts pre will present uh, uh, their view on the burning topics of bilateral relations of, and of the relationships between the uh, SCO member countries. Uh, today we will discuss the level of compatibility between Indian and Uzbekistan uh, foreign policy strategies between two partners and other SCO members. Also we will discuss what are uh, the common strategic goals of India and Uzbekistan and how it's related to uh, to Indian Connect Central Asian strategy with its uh, outreach to Central Asia. And uh, also we will uh, discuss uh, Uzbekistan regional initiatives. Also, some experts will focus on Shanghai Cooperation Organization. What are the prospects not only of the security cooperation, but also of the economic uh, cooperation? How it's possible uh, to strengthen the bonds of regional cooperation of the organization that accounts about 40% of the world's population and uh, a quarter of the world's GDP. And it's a great uh, honor uh, for me and for Tilatoma Foundation to present uh, Dr. Farhat Tolibov, director of Belim Karboni, Tashkent, Uzbekistan. Uh, Dr. Farhat, salam alaikum, uh, thanks a lot. The floor is yours. Alaikum asalam. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, once again. Thank you very much to the Town Foundation um, for kindly inviting me to this uh, interesting discussion. Um, I don't know how much uh, time I have. What's my time framework? Time frame? I suppose about minutes. 12 minutes, I suppose, Dr. Farhad. The... Sorry? About uh, 12, 15 minutes. All right. Um, <clears throat> well, um, uh, first of all, um, uh, I'd like to say that uh, the uh, overall topic, uh, Uzbekistan foreign relations, as it was uh, announced in the beginning, uh, is so uh, broadly defined. And uh, there is too much, uh, there are too, so many views uh, and, uh, you know, opinions, uh, analysis, uh, which can be uh, expressed within this broad topic. I decided to concentrate uh, perhaps more on uh, some conceptual aspects of uh, foreign policy in uh, the title of my presentation short presentation perhaps will be uh, what is a strategic partnership 
uh, in the Uzbekistan Indian case? Well, <coughs> sorry, uh, because uh, we uh, when we talk about India Uzbekistan strategic partnership um, in uh, not only India Uzbekistan, but in general, when we talk about strategic partnership, very often uh, experts do not define what strategic partnership uh, actually means. And uh, sometimes they mean different things uh, in different contexts. Uh, that's why uh, when we talk about uh, India Uzbekistan strategic partnership, we uh, have to uh, clarify what we mean by uh, strategic partnership and how uh, and in which um, aspects strategic partnership differs from ordinary cooperation. And uh, in this uh, context, uh, first of all, I would like to uh, emphasize the importance of this um, issue and uh, begin with uh, just very brief uh, elaboration of uh, uh, the meaning of the strategic partnership. And uh, then we'll uh, be focusing on uh, the meaning of strategic partnership between Uzbekistan and uh, India. So uh, for me, um, the uh, overall strategic partnership uh, means um, quite uh, interesting phenomenon. Uh, and it has several, um, uh, you know, um, connotations or several uh, nuances, uh, dimensions, I would say. First of all, uh, the, uh, when, when uh, we talk about strategic partnership, we mean that <coughs> the sites uh, who are called strategic partners reached uh, the very high level of mutual trust and confidence. This is first. Second, cooperation between them is intended for a long-term perspective because the very word strategy means the long-term intentions. Then uh, intensive cooperation includes not just one, but many spheres. It means that strategic partnership should be comprehensive. It, it includes economic, political, cultural, military, security, and other spheres. Another uh, uh, feature of strategic partnership is that the sites have common or very close interests in the international uh, politics and can correlate their positions on key international issues. And finally, uh, such a partnership, strategic partnership, inevitably has long-term geopolitical implications, either on the regional level or international level. So this is how I uh, define uh, strategic partnership. And in uh, various uh, articles, I just developed this concept and uh, as applied to uh, several strategic partnership cases like US, Uzbekistan, Russia, Uzbekistan, China, Uzbekistan, India, Uzbekistan strategic partnership. You know, there are actually many strategic partnerships in which Uzbekistan is involved. And uh, interestingly, uh, to compare the meanings of strategic partnership of Uzbekistan uh, with different uh, countries, different uh, states, we uh, can notice uh, you know, some specific nuances uh, and uh, can conclude that strategic partnership with the United States, for example, uh, is different uh, than strategic partnership of Uzbekistan with Russia, which is in turn is different from uh, strategic partnership with China and uh, strategic partnership with uh, India and so on and so on. For instance, uh, strategic partnership with the United States uh, of Uzbekistan. I mean, uh, with the United States uh, imply, it's quite comprehensive and it, it implies uh, uh, the uh, common vision of uh, threats and uh, the possibility of political consultations when uh, uh, one of the sites of strategic partnership uh, you know, faces security threats. Uh, moreover, this uh, partnership also envisages uh, the support provided by the United States to Uzbekistan in the sphere of democratic reforms. When you, this, this is just brief description, uh, when you read, uh, for example, the, uh, so the, uh, the text of the uh, Uzbekistan-Russia strategic partnership, you will see something else. It is less um, focused on, uh, you know, democratic reforms, but more focused on uh, military aspects and the possibility 
of military assistance in case of uh, security threats to one of the sites and so on and so on. I will uh, later on uh, in a minute talk about Uzbekistan-India strategic partnership. Uh, so uh, at this point, I just uh, wanted to emphasize that there are different strategic partnerships which emphasize, emphasize and uh, you know, point out to different uh, contexts. When we talk about foreign policy of Uzbekistan, which is also the topic of our today's discussion, I think uh, it is important to um, distinguish uh, two, I would say, you know, macro uh, stages uh, in the overall history of uh, independent Uzbekistan since 1991. And uh, the first period I symbolically call Uzbekistan 1.0 and the second period, uh, the current stage I call Uzbekistan 2.0. Zero. And in these two stages, we see different domestic policies, uh, which Uzbekistan the leadership conducted, and then also different foreign policies, which Uzbekistan leadership uh, is conducting today. Uh, well, uh, you know, uh, for instance, uh, these differences um, are reflected uh, in a number of uh, cases, uh, in a number of uh, documents, initiatives, which Uzbekistan advanced uh, different time, at different times. <coughs> uh, especially, inter it's interesting to compare uh, fundamental documents, which uh, reflects the meaning, the nuances, the peculiarities of foreign policy, uh, which is called foreign policy concepts or foreign policy doctrine. Foreign policy doctrine of uh, Uzbekistan 1.0 uh, emphasizes several principles uh, of foreign policy. Uh, for instance, uh, non-participation uh, in uh, any military political bloc, uh, active participation in international organizations, de-ideologization of foreign policy, non-interference in internal affairs of other states, supremacy of international law and priority of national interests. Uh, these are quite, uh, you know, on one hand, um, very specific to Uzbekistan, maybe uh, as compared to other regional countries, but at the same time, uh, they sound quite universal, quite, uh, you know, familiar to experts uh, who uh, see uh, just the common expression of uh, Uzbekistan foreign policy goals and principles. When we uh, look at uh, Uzbekistan 2.0 foreign policy doctrine or concept, uh, you can uh, notice uh, what I call in my articles for uh, no's. Uh, I mean, uh, this, uh, uh, you know, this concept emphasizes uh, for no's, no to deployment of foreign bases in, the Uzbekistan, in Uzbekistan, no to the membership in any military bloc, no to the participation in international peace building, peace keeping operations, and finally, no to mediation of any external power in the resolution of regional conflicts in Central Asia. So this is just briefly to describe um, foreign policy uh, development uh, of Uzbekistan since gaining independence from 1991 up to now. Um, of course, uh, even uh, in a narrowed uh, way, it is not enough to describe, uh, you know, the development of foreign policy of Uzbekistan. Although I'm focused on only strategic partnership phenomenon, uh, even then uh, it is difficult to explain, to describe, uh, you know, um, comprehensively uh, the all, uh, you know, nuances, uh, turns, of foreign policy in different uh, periods of independent development. Of course, we can discuss it later if uh, some questions arise uh, about foreign policy of Uzbekistan. And finally, now I will just say a few words about Uzbekistan-India strategic partnership. Uh, actually, uh, such a you know, uh, style, such a mode of cooperation, uh, which is called strategic partnership between India and Uzbekistan uh, was established in May 2011, during the uh, first president of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov's visit to India. Uh, and both sides signed uh, the uh, joint statement, which declared the establishment of strategic partnership. 
And interestingly, I, again, uh, in the beginning, I compared the text uh, of uh, strategic partnership uh, for Uzbekistan with the United States, with Russia. Now, uh, if, again, uh, let me just uh, you know express some exertions uh, from uh, the text of the India-Uzbekistan joint uh, statement on strategic partnership. And you will see how interesting uh, it is in terms of uh, what are um, what is indicated as the ultimate goal of uh, strategic partnership. And I will just uh, briefly, uh, you know, talk, uh, say, you know, look, show some uh, exceptions uh, from the text itself. Uh, for instance, the Article Five of the Declaration says uh, that uh, strategic partnership encompasses active cooperation in a wide spectrum of areas, including political, economic, counterterrorism, education, health, human resource development, science and technology, tourism, and culture. Uh, if you read Article 6, uh, you will see interesting uh, message, which says, the sites noted with satisfaction the conclusion of bilateral documents during the visit of cooperation, visit uh, on cooperation in a range of areas, including information technology, pharmaceuticals, standardization, small and medium enterprises, uh, coal uh, gasification, oil and gas, science and technology, textiles, and banking. As you see from these short uh, exceptions, uh, the overall enumeration of spheres also indicates that uh, the uh, strategic partnership is quite unique, quite specific, because it is so uh, multi-dimensional. Um, but when we talk about strategic partnership, as I uh, said in the beginning, I'm coming to the end, um, you know, uh, it includes sort of cooperation, close cooperation uh, and correlation of policies in the sphere of security. In this sense, let me just briefly uh, read the Article 11 of this uh, joint statement. Afghanistan, uh, sorry, uh, it says the Article 11 <clears throat> of the joint statement. This size highlighted the absence of surface transport connectivity as one of the reasons for the low level of trade between the two countries. To resolve these connectivity problems, the sites discussed implementation of such projects as the uh, Trans-Afghan Corridor and the project to establish the uh, Central Asia Persian Gulf Corridor. The implementation of these projects may considerably cut down the distance and costs for transportation of goods between Uzbekistan and India, as well as provide Afghanistan the opportunity to integrate into the regional system of transport connectivity. The sites agreed to continue their work in terms of looking for various options to, for, for surface connectivity between India and Uzbekistan. And let me finish with the Article 16. Interestingly, uh, it says uh, the following, just last point. Uh, the sites of the joint statement resolutely condemned terrorism in all its forms and manifestations and reaffirmed that international terrorism was a threat to global peace and security. It was noted with satisfaction that the fourth meeting of the Indo, the then fourth meeting of the Indo-Uzbek Joint Working Group on Combating International Terrorism uh, discussed several issues of security and counterterrorism, including exchange of information, data, financing of terrorism, and related matters. They emphasized the need for adoption of the Comprehensive Convention on International Terrorism. This is just briefly what I wanted to say because I have very uh, you know, limited time. Uh, and uh, just my, my, my uh, purpose was just uh, to uh, you know, uh, talk about the meaning of uh, strategic partnership in general and how strategic partnership between Uzbekistan and India is uh, being developed. So uh, of course, uh, we can uh, further discuss uh, this issue during the Q&A period. Thank you for your attention. Uh, Dr. Farhad, thanks a lot. Uh, Dalshot uh, Hamidovich had mentioned his study at the Mad University, and I also have uh, some friends who are alumni of this university and who are brilliant scholars and practitioners, and now I understand that it's all due to such uh, bright professors in, at the Mad. Thanks a let lot. Me, let me Anna, just briefly uh, say I'm so proud of seeing uh, Dilshot, my former student, uh, in this high ranking position, uh, recently appointed as the ambassador of Uzbekistan to India. So, Dershot, I'm so proud of you. 
Good luck. Good luck to you. Thank you, Thank you very much, teacher. <laughs> Thank you. The mo this is the greatest moment for all of us who teach at the universities. And uh, also, as the chair, I would like to ask you one short, brief question. You've mentioned that strategic partners should have mutual trust and confidence, and they should have mutual long-term interests. But what about values? Should they have uh, common values? Wow, super question. Very, very important, very actual. And uh, again, uh, if you compare the text of strategic partnerships, uh, uh, which Uzbekistan signed with different countries, with uh, especially great powers such as US, Russia, China, India, you will see that some of them, some of them, not all of them, some of them, especially uh, uh, Uzbekistan US strategic partnership and Uzbekistan India strategic partnership, interestingly, you know, make more emphasis, uh, great emphasis on normative aspect of strategic partnership. For instance, Uzbekistan. U.S. strategic partnership text uh, mentions 11 times. If you make a content analysis, you will see 11 times uh, when uh, in the text uh, the sites talk about or you know write um, or mention the word democracy in different you know prefixes with different prefixes and suffixes like democracy, democratic, democratization, and everything like this. So uh, democracy focused, if you want. Um, strategic partnership is also uh, important for U.S. Uzbekistan strategic partner. It, so it is to some extent normative driven. Uh, the same can be said about Uzbekistan India uh, strategic partnership. It is also it also contains contains provisions uh, in the text uh, which emphasize the normative uh, uh, issues values uh, beginning from uh, you know cultural uh, issues. Uh, common uh, historical backgrounds, things like that, uh, and uh, emphasize peace, uh, peaceful cooperation in a multi, as I mentioned, multi-dimensional uh, co cooperation, which is also, uh, you know, value-driven, I guess. So, uh, and I, uh, besides besides uh, the uh, strategic partnership context in general, in general, I think uh, India and Uzbekistan uh, accumulated over centuries, over centuries. Uh, the great assets uh, of uh, you know interactions, interactions, historical interactions, which also uh, contribute or create uh, the great level uh, or great basis for future uh, cooperation, which is also uh, which 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 should be uh, also uh, you know value driven. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Farhad. Uh, now. I would like uh, to present our next uh, speaker, Dr. Abhishek Srivastava, Assistant Professor, Diplomacy and Disarmament, School of International Studies, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Uh, Dr. Abhishek, uh, hello, Shubh Sanhya, and yes. uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anna. Uh, very good evening to all of you, and my greetings to uh, His Excellency and my co-panelists, Dr. Talipo and Dr. Akram. Let me congratulate Tilotma Foundation to organize such a wonderful webinar on this very pertinent topic and thank you for inviting me. Uh, both of eminent scholars very, um, are very um, knowledgeable and very uh, much expert on this topic. So uh, I'll focus on India-Uzbekistan uh, strategic engagement and bi at bilateral level and in SCO. So my discussion, so in my discussion, I'll speak on India-Uzbekistan uh, shared past and common future. Our relationship between India and Uzbekistan has ancient roots and now occupies a significant place in India's future. These are the words of Prime Minister Modi when he visited Uzbekistan in 2015. In the coming decade, both countries can write a new chapter in an ancient relationship. So relationship between Uzbekistan and India have their roots deep in history. These are frequent references to Kambos in Sanskrit and Pali literature, 
which is stated to include parts of present day uzbekistan sarkars uh, participated in mahabharat mahabharat is a historical facts or a, or a history in india they are very popular uh, in later year fargana samarkand bukhara in uzbekistan emerged as a major city on the trade routes with europe and china at various time the sakasinthians macedonian greco bactrian kushan kingdoms included parts of both india and the present day uzbekistan and at other time they were part of neighboring empires another link is buddhism this is said to have traveled to china through uzbekistan and central asia indian merchants based in samarkand and bukhara were an integral part of local economy interaction over thousands of year contributed to close cultural linkages in architecture dance music and cuisines india has india had also very close interaction uh, with uzbekistan during the soviet times the unfortunate incident happened in 1966 when indian prime minister lal bahadur shastri died in tashkent after disintegration of ussr president karimo has taken forward the legacy of excellent relationship between india and uzbekistan and now uh, president shaukat mirziyev is also maintaining the legacy our relationship is served as a solid foundation for the development and strengthening of bilateral cooperation in economic political cultural and humanitarian spheres during prime minister narendra modi visit to uzbekistan both countries have decided to work on key bilateral and regional issues including the situation in afghanistan as the two countries inked three pacts to boost cooperation between their between them that is the culture and tourism we have reached to the next level when foreign minister of uzbekistan mr abdulaziz kamilov came india in 2017 with a high level multi sectoral delegation this was the uh, game changer visit this was the game changer visit between the two countries the 22 contracts worth more than 80 million us dollar and 20 investment agreements worth over 70 us million dollar were signed at the forum india and uzbekistan has set a bilateral trade on 1 billion us dollar by 2020 both countries have announced that they will jointly work together and strive for a stable peaceful and prosperous afghanistan because this afghanistan is a major point of cooperation between india and uzbekistan at the strategic co- cooperation there are many point of cooperation other i will explain in my end uh, end of the presentation uh so india and uzbekistan uh, noted global threats and challenges whether financial instability or extremism the situation in afghanistan is of particular concern of both sides in- interestingly one of the first point of joint statement was a reaffirmation that their engagement is based on mutual respect for development model chosen by each country in accordance with its domestic condition and based on their national interests india and uzbekistan signed seven agreement in the field of education mineral prospecting and stepping up the joint joint fight against international terrorism religious action extremism and drug trafficking 
This is undoubtedly increase India's stake in Central Asia. There is another important co consideration in recognition of the changes made in Uzbekistan. Negotiations were launched with India on an agreement offering a deeper partnership and cooperation. Numerous steps have taken have been taken, particularly around the economy. Liberalizing the exchanges, exchange rates of the country's currency, the SOM came as a real bolt from the blue in 2016. This liberalization was accompanied by other measures which significantly improved and the investment climate. And Uzbekistan was recently pleased that it had jumped from 87 to 76 place out of 190 countries which were assessed in the latest doing business report from the World Bank. This is also a favorable condition uh, for the cooperation between the two countries. In 2019, India and Uzbekistan signed three pacts on cooperation in security aspects. The agreements were signed on the sideline of the Council of heads and governments of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. We all know that India became permanent member of SCO in 2017. Memorandum, memorandum of understanding on cooperation in military medicine between the armed force for the two countries. The other two MOUs were signed between in, institutes of higher military learning and the two countries for training and capacity building. I'm quite sure that it will further enhance the level of defense in line with India's strategic partnership with Uzbekistan. The enhanced cooperation between the two old friends, along with their shared views on a host of regional and global issues, including combating terrorism, extremism, and regional stability and security. In the same year, 2019, an Uzbekistan India and Uzbekistan launched first ever joint exercise Dustlik 2019, primarily focused on the counter-terrorism, an area of which the two countries share a common concern. As India has a long experience in combat operation against terrorism in Jammu and Kashmir, we both are facing the challenges of cross-border terrorism. The aim of the Dust Click 2019 is to enable the exchange of best practices and experience between armed forces of the two countries, and both countries reaffirm their common interest in ensuring regional peace and security. During President Shaukat Mirziyoyev's visit in the Guj vibrant Gujarat Global Summit as a guest of honor in 2019, an agreement on the long-term supply of uranium ore concentrate for India's energy needs between the, develop, between the, de, between the develop, uh, Department of Atomic Energy and the Navoi Mining and Metallurgical Combine of Uzbekistan was signed. India has also offered to consider further credit of USD 800 million under lines of credit and buyers credit mechanism exim bank. Bilateral relations are managed through a robust mechanism, including an intergovernmental commission, which oversee trade and economic relations and foreign offices consultation. Uzbekistan and India have signed agreements, MOUs, protocols, joint statements in the areas such as trade, investment, education, civil aviation, tourism, science and technology, telecommunication, agriculture, and information and technology. So uh, in the SCO, uh, uh, now I'm coming on the SCO, it is the largest regional organization in the world in terms of geographical coverage and population, covering three-fifths of the Eurasian continent and nearly half of the human population. After joining SCO in the 18th meeting of Council of the Heads and Governments 
of the SCO countries as the special envoy of Prime Minister Narendra Modi in Tashkent. Rajnath Singh, the Defence Minister of India, urged the SCO to work together in defeating challenges like terrorism, climate change, endemic poverty under the development of many cooperation. Pandemics and inequality is a major challenge in the region also. During COVID-19, all countries have locked their borders so the debate started that is world going toward the protectionism, but I'm quite, but I can say the unilateralism and protectionism have done good to none. Yes. At the end of my presentation, my submission is what uh, the take away from this, uh, from the today's webinar, we need approaches which are inclusive, transparent, and firmly anchored in multilateralism. Successful multilateralism also needs adherence to core principle of respect for sovereignty and territorial integrity, non-interference and mutual cooperation. India and Uzbekistan should focus on, I, I, I have uh, write down a few points uh, for the cop. Uh, for the cooperation uh, between India and Uzbekistan. The first is military and technical cooperation. Second, enhancing military to military cooperation, joint exercises and fight against radicalism. Third, Uzbekistan is very important for India. They can be one of the main supplier of uranium for Indian nuclear reactors. Next, both countries can actively cooperate within the framework of international organizations such as United Nations, SCO, and others. We support each other's initiative. Fifth, India's growing development, uh, India's growing developing small and medium business sector share of which India's GDP is 67%. In this regard, cooperation in the development of small and medium businesses, processing of gyms, hotel, restaurant businesses is of the great interest to Uzbekistan. In cotton industry, India and Uzbekistan can do larger cooperation as in India handloom is in big demand. In the wake of climate change issues, every country is focusing on clean energy. 23%, as I know, um, if I'm wrong, uh, the co-panelists can correct me, 23% uh, of Uzbekistan energy resources are based on clean energy. Uzbekistan and India can do a lot in this sector also. India needs to come up with its own connectivity projects along with economic and strategic cooperation with the Central Asian countries. The emerging geopolitical situation requires India and Uzbekistan to restructure their relation along with their respective roles in Central Asian region. India, Uzbekistan relations have significant development potential. Both countries are seeking to address this by diversifying their cooperation in different sectors. Central Asia is an economically and strategically important region for India, as India seeks to increase its engagement with Central Asia, Uzbekistan has emerged as a key partner. Thank you so much. If any question on my presentation, this is highly welcome. Thank you. Dr. Abhishek, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, you've mentioned uh, that uh, SCO uh, partners have respect for the, the development of internal political processes uh, in uh, their states and for the rejection of uh, what uh, George Frost Cannon was calling legalistic moralistic approach to international relations. Do you think that uh, they all SCO countries reject uh, Western understanding of the rules-based order, or do they have various understanding of it?
I'm sorry, we can't hear you. Okay. Uh, can you uh, repeat your last part of the question? Last part of the question. What are the um, uh, Western rule based? Yes, yes. Uh, do you think that SEO countries reject uh, Western perspective of the rules based uh, order? I mean, the Western perspective of these rules of international order? See, uh, there are many uh, very nice uh, question. Uh, there are many changes is going to happen uh, in the post COVID world. Uh, and basically in Asia, uh, there are, in Asia, there is a question of geopolitical sifting uh, because of some changes which we are, uh, which we are witnessing. So uh, through SEO, SEO is the best platform to solve uh, our concern and uh, I don't think the Western rule-based model will help us. We have to evolve our model to resolve extremism, uh, the extremism, the border uh, conflict and the uh, problem of terrorism in this region. So sovereignty, respect, uh, the mutual respect for sovereignty is very important and uh, non-interference uh, in any domestic um, uh, activity, in any domestic activity is, uh, is uh, highly appreciable. But uh, I think, I think there are some uh, global values. There are some global values uh, for that, uh, which, uh, uh, Professor Tolipo has also mentioned there are some global values. Uh, so for that, we can cooperate uh, among, uh, uh, we can cooperate with each other and that will uh, make SEO more significant and more pragmatic. Okay, thanks a lot, Doctor, for your wonderful presentation. And now we would like to come to the next uh, speaker from Uzbekistan. It's Dr. Akram Umarov, Senior Research Fellow at the University of World Economy and Diplomacy, Tashkent, uh, Uzbekistan. Thank you very much. Thanks for this opportunity for the, uh, for the foundation, for the moderator. And I would, at the beginning of my speech, I would like also underline the fact that I'm also alumni of the University of World Economy and Diplomacy, and I'm very proud for the, of this. And uh, I would like mostly speak about SEO. It's uh, some challenges which it's facing now and some perspectives which can lead to further development of this organization and slightly touch upon the India-Uzbekistan cooperation. Thanks to my colleagues, panelists, Dr. Talipov, Dr. Srivastava for making my job much easier presenting this comprehensive picture of India-Uzbek relations. So I would, I would like to uh, mostly speak about SEO. So in my view, the current challenges for the SEO, uh, are the first one is uh, enhancement, the need for the enhancement of economic cooperation. We know that SEO mostly prefers uh, to prioritize its security pillar in its cooperation, and it has already uh, reached some good results in this. There are good achievements in this sphere. We have, uh, we have already this uh, regional anti-terroristic structure in Tashkent. We have regular meetings of this different security services uh, on the law enforcement services of uh, regional or of SEO member states. And uh, we have the re re an annual operation, anti-drug operation within SEO. And we, have, we also have uh, the, this ongoing and new um, military trainings of member states, uh, armies and other special services. And it's very good tradition and it helps uh, to create this very important trust and to, to improve uh, the uh, security provision in this SEO member states. But at the same time, uh, it, uh, to some extent, uh, this, uh, the prioritization of security issues uh, making this economic cooperation slightly behind this 
uh, the, the development of SEO. But at the same time, especially in the current situation with the situation of pandemic and, the, or, and this world uh, economic decline and uh, the decline in the SEO member states, I think this economic pillar should be uh, advanced more and more in the, in the close future of SEO development. And there are a lot of potential to do common things in this sphere. Uh, if you look on the numbers of uh, bilateral trade between the uh, SEO member states, if you look the, on the existing infrastructure and the perspectives to uh, construct new infrastructure in this region, so we can see the, the huge potential for the development of economic cooperation. And uh, mutual investments are very important in, this, in the current uh, realities. And I, I believe that we cannot, any country in the world cannot uh, 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 tackle these economic challenges which are now we are facing uh, unilaterally. We need this cooperation on a regional basis, on a multilateral basis, and SEO can be a very good platform. We already have some good uh, results in this sphere. For example, in 2014, there was a very important document adopted within the SEO. The, it was an agreement on uh, on the transport road transportation facilitation between the SEO member states, and it uh, it make it made it easier to um, acknowledge driving licenses of uh, SEO member states and uh, transit fees for the uh, transportation companies. So these small things brought a lot of good uh, results in the SEO development. I think this kind of uh, issue should be developed more. And I think there is an understanding within SEO also that this pillar should be developed more. If we look on the last year's summit in uh, SEO summit uh, uh, from 22 documents which were adopted by heads of state, 10 were devoted to the economic cooperation issues. But, uh, but the, the, the second issue is very close to this uh, document, uh, adopted documents, documents uh, agreements within SEO. We need, uh, within SEO, we need proper implementation of the signed documents. I think this is a very, um, uh, this is a very uh, big challenge for the SEO because we know SEO usually uh, sign, SEO members signs a lot of documents, but the uh, proper implementation in our life is, can be a bit problematic, and it can take a lot of time. It can take a lot of further agree, uh, agreements and negotiations between SEO member states and it, it uh, negatively affects on this timely impl implementation of such documents. And the, also we need to enhance maybe within this problem, we need to increase the number of different working groups, expert groups, which can discuss the existing issues between the SEO member states and, uh, and uh, propose some uh, new decisions which can make this uh, decision-making process much easier and much quicker. For example, if we look on the current pandemic situation, of course, the health uh, uh, healthcare systems system is not a priority for SEO, but uh, at the same time, SEO has several documents which are devoted to the cooperation in the sphere. And there was a experts meetings uh, between the SEO member states discussing the response of SEO to the current pandemic and how they can, this SEO member states can coordinate their measures in responding to such a huge, pand a huge uh, challenge. But at the same time, we still doesn't, uh, we, we, could, we still hasn't seen this health ministers meeting, online meeting at least. And we're still waiting for this SEO summit, which are planned to, uh, to be hosted by Russia this year, and uh, but can and important documents can be adopted only on this summit by the heads of states. But a pandemic cannot wait so long, and it needs very quick and uh, comprehensive response. And I think it's a very good 
uh, time and opportunity for the SEO to think more about this decision-making process and to create new forms of uh, some quick uh, reaction to such uh, issues which are very important for all member states. And this challenge is also linked with the next one, which I would like to underline that we need uh, to work more on, on building trust and cohesion between member states. And we know that there are still, uh, uh, there are still some existing bilateral issues between uh, SEO member states, uh, mostly border issues. And also there are some other economic and political issues which can uh, have negative uh, effect on the overall cooperation within SEO. And SEO, of course, uh, it's, it's, it's underlined in all SEO documents that SEO cannot intervene in domestic issues and cannot act unilaterally in, in, in the case of some conflicts or difficult issues between the SEO member states without proper appeal from the states. But at the same time, this kind of problems creates, uh, uh, let's say, some not very good atmosphere within SEO and it can um, prevent the proper implementation of the adopted documents and of the in, in, an expansion of the further cooperation within SEO. So, uh, but if we try to pay more attention to, for example, to cultural humanitarian sphere, we know that as my colleague, Dr. Srivastava excellently uh, mentioned the history of India-Uzbek relations and how our historical and current relations are linked to how many similarities we have, how many close links we have between each other. And we can find the similar things with all other SEO members. And we can uh, put more, um, uh, we should uh, underline these issues more and to, to create this kind of trust and to create cohesion between our states. And we also maybe should work more on interparliamentary uh, cooperation uh, to increase this uh, trust and cohesion between member states. The next uh, challenge and opportunity for the SEO is Afghanistan, in my understanding. And Afghanistan can be the excellent uh, uh, issue where SEO member states can uh, can be very can have very fruitful uh, cooperation and can reach very important uh, results. We know that um, all SEO or uh, SEO members and its observers uh, are mostly all of them involved in this Afghan issue, uh, Afghan conflict. They're all very interested in, the, in building trust and in building peace and uh, stopping conflict in Afghanistan. So SEO can do more, much more than now it's doing in Afghanistan. It, it has adopted, uh, it has created a contact group to, to Afghanistan, but we cannot see still the, the, the real results and steps within SEO to pay more attention to the to Afghan problem. If we analyze the speeches of all uh, SEO member states, heads of SEO member states, ministers of foreign affairs, they almost all of them in all their speeches within SEO of different meetings underline the fact that they, we need to work more on Afghanistan, but still we do not see the proper um, steps to, uh, to advance this issue. And of course, uh, final challenge in my understanding is this kind, kind of, it's very popular uh, in, in Western media to label SEO as kind of anti-Western bloc. And I think SEO should work more on its, as it, let's say on this public diplomacy to eliminate this anti-Western labeling of the uh, Shanghai Cooperation Organization. And it's, uh, of course, it's, it's, this platform can be used by different states, by different member states to express their position, foreign policy priorities and their positions towards different international problems, but it doesn't mean that SEO is kind of anti-Western uh, organization. And I think that especially Central Asia 
is not interested at all in 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 being a part or being labeled as as a part of some kind of anti-Western coalition or bloc in 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 the Eurasian continent. So these are very uh, important uh, challenges for the SEO, which exists exist now, and I think uh, SEO can have all potential and all um, uh, in instruments to tackle these challenges, but uh, the the issue is to to give priority to these issues and to work more on building um, trust and proper implementation of the adopted documents. If you let me briefly stop on India Uzbekistan cooperation, I think India's membership of, of, of the SEO has added a new dimension to the strategic engagement uh, between India and Uzbekistan. Uh, and before, uh, for many years after the collapse of the Soviet Union, in my view, uh, India's engagement with Tashkent to some extent was uh, had been episodic and modest. There were some uh, attempts to enhance this cooperation. If you if you remember the connect to Central Asia policy, which was which which it was adopted in 2012, and there were some similar initiatives before, but uh, they couldn't reach a very um, uh, big results. But, and mostly India can, was constrained by some geopolitical issues in the region. Of course, the main problem is uh, lack of direct surface access between India and uh, Central Asia. But uh, the new era cooperation initiated by the Prime Minister Modi and Uzbek President Mirziyoyev in 2018 and 2019 have added a new momentum to bilateral uh, ties. And I think they, they are now trying to address these challenges of connectivity, of, of mutual understanding and cohesion between the adopted uh, plans and uh, development uh, priorities for these countries. We know that both countries are now going through this very difficult but very important stage of transformation. And there are much things, there are very, a lot of uh, similar things and we can think about some kind of cohesion of our development plans for the future. And India's this renewed outreach to the region along with the new domestic and foreign policy of in, in orientation of Uzbekistan has opened up uh, untapped opportunities for the strategic collaboration between these uh, countries and it can we can uh, reach uh, uh, in our bilateral cooperation to a new uh, to great heights but what is important is the sustainable engagement between countries and we need to think more about some innovative approach to our uh, cooperation uh, my colleagues already mentioned some areas and i think uzbekistan can be very important and key partner of uh, India in its new strategy of ACT North, ACT North strategy and it's improving connectivity with Northern countries, building this uh, uh, North to South corridor. And in my view, priority spheres of India-Uzbekistan cooperation can be of course, uh, counter-terrorism. Both countries are very in interested in this issue, improving connectivity, building infrastructure, including in Afghanistan and Uzbekistan and Afghanistan uh, and Uzbekistan and India are uh, a kind of unique countries in the world which already implemented the large infrastructure projects in, uh, in Afghanistan and we can speak, uh, we can talk about the further enhancement of this uh, cooperation. Of course, pharmaceutical manufacturing can be important, IT sphere development and of course healthcare spheres can be priorities for the uh, close future of Uzbek-India uh, cooperation. So uh, thank you for this opportunity. I'd like to stop here and I'm open for any questions and comments during our Q&A session. Thank you.
Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Akram. Uh, just uh, one brief uh, question. You've uh, mentioned uh, security and economic uh, pillars of uh, SEO cooperation, and you've, you've also mentioned humanitarian pillar. And do you think that something more could be done uh, in this uh, sphere. Personally, me, I believe that uh, we have SEO University, but that's not enough. And we could strengthen uh, cooperation in the sphere of science diplomacy, in the sphere of field studies, of the joint research articles, of the some universities of people to people diplomacy. And for sure, there should be more grassroots initiatives, but they should be uh, sponsored on the state level. So would you agree? Absolutely agree with you. I think that uh, as you as, as you label the science diplomacy can be very important within SEO and uh, the enhancement of people to people cooperation. And again, is this pandemic creates a huge opportunities for this. Now we, we have we are now observing that many countries are joining their efforts to to respond properly to this crisis. To for example to create vaccine for this um, uh, infection. But, uh, and SEO can do much more in these spheres and enhance, enhancing this cooperation in, in science sphere can be also, of course, very important. And you mentioned correctly that the way, and it's not only about creating one university, but we can think about them creating some science centers in different parts of SEO, focusing on different areas. Uh, thanks a lot. I would like to thank uh, all our distinguished speakers and now we will have a question and uh, answers session and I would like to thank His Excellency Mr. Ambassador for still being here with us. It's a great honor for us and now we have uh, some uh, question from uh, our viewers, the first question is to all the panelists. It sounds how India can defend its interests in Central Asia within SCO while China blocking almost all attempts of India to develop its presence in Central Asia, including security, economic and so on. Are there volunteers to answer this question? Uh, it's very interesting and <clears throat> at the same time difficult question uh, because, for example, we are not involved in this bureaucratic level of SEO interaction. Maybe we were, we will, maybe we are not aware of this grassroots um, procedures which are happening and the blocking of different initiatives. But uh, according to the SEO regulation, SEO documents, all countries have the same vote and have, have the same status. So uh, it means that India should maybe work more with, our, we, we should work more with other SEO member states. And if there will be kind of <clears throat> unified at position with, well, between all SEO members besides China, and then this way maybe they can uh, persuade China to uh, to agree with this position or to make some to find some consensus in these issues, and India can also do much more things uh, not only within Asia but in its bilateral cooperation with Central Asian countries. Uh, may I add something? Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Ayla. Uh, the question uh, was very interesting. So I think India have very old relation with the, uh, all Central Asian countries. We have the civilizational roots. And uh, uh, I, I don't think there is any great game politics between India and China in Central Asia. Um, although China uh, is doing the great game uh, politics in the, in the Indo-Pacific region. So I don't think China will open the another front for the great game. And uh, uh, because of SCO, uh, it, it's really helpful for India to uh, leverage or uh, to improve our oh, century-old relationship with the all Central Asian country. Uh, we are doing bilaterally good. We are uh, and at this SCO, uh, uh, 
as my understanding uh, we will discuss the regional issue and the global issues seo seo is very important uh, multilateral organization in the asian continent so uh, i think uh, for the bilateral conflict we have to keep aside this the bilateral conflict between the two countries and um, uh, that will be the more uh, useful and that will be the more fruitful for the seo thank you Thanks a lot. Uh, and I would like just to underline the fact that Asia is not only about Central Asia. Yes, at the beginning, yes, Asia was mostly focused on Central Asia, but the expansion of Asia and adding of new members, joining of new members is making now Asia not a Central Asia regional organization, but more Eurasian continental organization. So it's not only about Central Asia. Thanks a lot. And the next question is how HCO can tackle Indian-Pakistan conflict to be solved, taking into consideration of all regional powers? Uh, may I? Because it's uh, India and Pakistan. <laughs> Uh, this, I will uh, say a few words. After that, uh, Dr. Tolipo and Dr. Akram can add uh, more thing on the perspe uh, perspective of SCO. This is the India and Pakistan border conflict is the, is the solely bilateral issue. And uh, uh, this is the understanding between India and Pakistan that we will uh, solve this bilateral issue uh, through bilateral dialogues and, the, and through bilateral uh, discussion. Uh, SCO is the multilateral forum, and uh, uh, this is uh, understanding and the practices, the, the old practice, we will not, uh, and uh, uh, India and Pakistan will not raise their border conflict in uh, SCO. Uh, I think in my perspective, in, in my view, in my view, SCO will help to uh, build uh, confidence building uh, confidence building between India and Pakistan through SCO cooperation. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Thanks a lot. Uh, our next question is... As I, think, uh, Dr. Arna, I think uh, Dr. Tolipov wants to respond to this question. Oh, okay, thanks a lot, Hansen. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, uh, briefly, uh, you know, let me mention uh, that uh, um, the former president of Uzbekistan, Islam Karimov, was uh, uh, openly skeptical about joining of India and Pakistan to Shanghai Cooperation Organization. He didn't make a secret of his skepticism. And uh, in one of the SEO summits, uh, as far as I remember, it was Ufa summits in Russia. In the in Ufa town, uh, he uh, during his speech uh, said like this. I just paraphrase that um, the membership of India and Pakistan, two nuclear powers in the SCO uh, club, would dramatically change the global balance of power because from now on, in the SCO there would be not two but for nuclear powers. So that's this very fact would be a challenging in terms of shift in the <clears throat> excuse me, global uh, security uh, architecture, global balance of power. And uh, talking about the, let's say, antagonism between India and Pakistan, uh, I should say, uh, that uh, is my opinion that SCO is hardly capable to deal with the Indo-Pakistani conflict. Uh, that's why uh, I think we should look for some other formats or mechanisms to resolve, uh, let's say this uh, permanent Indo-Pakistani conflict and uh, which would be more relevant than the SCO, thank you. Thanks a lot, Dr. Farhat. And Tashkent has a good experience since 1966 in district diplomacy efforts. Thanks a lot. And uh, our next uh, question is also about bilateral conflicts. Uh, it sounds like 
As border conflict is going on between India and China, is there any plans or policy recommendations to conflict in member states by SCO? I think I slightly mentioned this issue during my uh, brief introduction that there are existing uh, issues and conflicts between member states and not in, only in South Asia, but also in Central Asia. And uh, SEO has no mandate to intervene in such conflicts without this, any appeal from the uh, conflicting states. And only what SEO can do in, that, in such a situation is, I think, to enhance this economic cooperation, enhance um, trust building measures between member states. So these issues can make any potential conflict between member states uh, very painful. And this way they can sink twice, four, five, seven times before going any in, in, in any conflict between uh, its uh, between SEO member states. So what all, only what SEO can do is to increase the level of cooperation and make any conflict very painful and destructive for uh, member states. Okay, thanks a lot. Um, Doctor, uh, uh, there, are, uh, there are a few questions. Can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yeah, there are a few questions from uh, some members of the foundation. I would like to pose the two questions. Uh, one of the questions uh, which I received is, uh, how can joint military exercises, such as the Dastili 2019, help to make the military of both India and Uzbekistan strongly capable to oppose the most uh, notorious terrorist activities, which tends to threaten both regional and territorial integrity, as well as peace? Sir, can you repeat your question? There was a you know problem with uh, yeah, connection. We, we, okay, yeah. okay, okay, okay. Because so what? Yeah, yeah. How can joint military exercises like the Dust Lake 2019, uh, the first joint military exercise between India and Uzbekistan, how can these uh, military exercises help both the militaries of India and Uzbekistan strongly capable to oppose the most notorious terrorist activities, which tends to threaten both regional and territorial integrity as well as peace? Yes, uh, interesting, but at the same time, very difficult question because uh, it, it concerns the uh, quite sensitive uh, aspect of uh, cooperation, military cooperation, joint exercises, military exercises of two countries, although they are, um, you know, um, considered as strategic partners which, uh, among other things, envisages military cooperation, cooperation in the uh, sphere of uh, security and so on. And by the way, uh, the joint declaration on strategic partnership between India and uh, Uzbekistan also mentions uh, this issue. Uh, but um, the resolution of uh, the overall complicated uh, problems related to terrorism, or for instance, in particular situation in Afghanistan can not only be uh, you know, dealt with by means of joint military exercises between some countries who are interested uh, in this, like Uzbekistan and India. From this perspective, uh, I think um, joint military exercises, which are important per se, uh, between India and Uzbekistan, I mean, which are important per se because uh, these exercises enrich both sides in terms of uh, operations, connectivity, military connectivity, and so on and so on. Um, at the same time, they are rather, uh, they should be considered rather as message, that uh, message to international community, uh, to uh, regional countries or potential uh, adversaries that uh, Uzbekistan and India uh, are moving towards you know, joint preparedness against possible threats. They are um, you know, correlating their positions, 
uh, they adjust uh, their policies in, in, in the sphere of uh, strategy, in the sphere of military uh, preparedness and so on and so on. So from this perspective, I think uh, it is uh, more interesting. I mean, military exercise as such is more interesting as a message, as a message to uh, all uh, observers, all uh, adversaries or uh, enemies of France that India and Pakistan have common uh, close positions uh, regarding different uh, threats, which Thank you. Okay, so I just wanted to ask you uh, about, I think, uh, uh, about, you know, the, you were talking about the, the two connectivity, uh, we, you were talking about the connectivity, uh, the issues that there is no direct land connectivity between uh, Uzbekistan and India. And and in this regard, I think Ashgabat Agreement and the INSTC, uh, how do you look at these two agreements, particularly when it comes to uh, the connectivity between India and uh, Uzbekistan, which is of strategic importance? Do you address your question to me? Yes, yes, you can go ahead and then we can come to other speakers also. All right. Um, well, just briefly, you would like to, uh, we, um, you know, just very, uh, briefly um, interpret this uh, situation. When we uh, use this fashionable word connectivity today, it is so fashionable. Um, it is uh, quite uh, ambiguous term. And uh, as applied to India-Uzbekistan uh, relations, what we mean by connectivity? If it means uh, access by Indian side, be them um, business circles, entrepreneurs, uh, strategic connectivity, and so on and so on and so on. If we uh, mean territorial connectivity, so we uh, mean um, geographical connotation of, connecti of this word, then uh, as everybody knows, it is a very difficult uh, issue because there is no direct connectivity, direct connection between India and, uh, Uzbek and Uzbekistan, and in general between India and Central Asia, because we are separated by high mountains on one side and by the territory of Pakistan and uh, Afghanistan on the other. That's why uh, connectivity uh, between India and Uzbekistan, for example, is different and looks differently uh, from uh, connectivity between Uzbekistan and China, for example, or connectivity between Uzbekistan and Russia and Uzbekistan and other Central Asian countries. Connectivity between within Central Asia is, uh, I would say, perfect, ideal to some extent. And uh, connectivity with great powers, even if, even if uh, they are so convenient from the territorial point of view, geographically, even if they are connectivity in this sense, they are, you know, how to say difficult. Uh, they are, they represent by themselves a very heavy burden from geopolitical point of view. So even if uh, India does its best to reach Central Asia somehow by some maneuvers, by some supporting uh, projects, transport project, infrastructure projects, corridors, projects, even then uh, uh, this kind of connectivity would inevitably have geopolitical implications. This is how I evaluate the situation. Geopolitics will go side by side with any success or failure of connectivity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Umarov. Uh, thank you. I think, as uh, I also slightly mentioned this, the absence of direct surface connection between India and Uzbekistan, which is preventing the full scale cooperation between the regions and Central Asia and India, not only Uzbekistan, but um, the development of different uh, transport corridors, especially the Chabahar port can be somehow response to this challenge. Of course, it's not an ideal way. It's not very cheap way of reaching uh, Central Asia and vice versa, India from Central Asia to India, but uh, it can be the, the solution of the current 
problem of uh, absence of access uh, between the uh, between India and Central Asia. But it's not just enough to build this port, to fund its building, uh, but it's more important to provide its sustainable work in future. So uh, we should work closely together on, on the transit fees, on the smooth um, uh, way from, from Central Asia to India, via Chabahar port. And it's not uh, only the uh, India, Uzbekistan or India, Central Asia issue. We should of course involve Iran in this issue. And this port is not only for India, Central Asia cooperation, and we can make it more economically viable and uh, uh, more uh, important for investors also. So we should make this way with this transport corridor as cheap as we can. And also um, to think about all uh, problems which can uh, arise after finishing the port itself, the, all the way from Central Asia to India. Thank you so much. I think there is one question. I think we can briefly use this, uh, pose this question to both of you. And if uh, Dr. Kolika also wants to come in. Uh, this question is, uh, I think, uh, that is coming in the chat, uh, the option that, does, uh, you, know, uh, you know, is China using the platform of the Shanghai Cooperation Organization for its own leverage? Uh, I don't think so, because uh, China understand that it's not the only power in, in SEO. And uh, first of all, there is, uh, until the expansion, there was a balancing role of Russia. Uh, and now we have, as um, it was already mentioned by my colleagues, four nuclear powers within SEO. Um, and I don't think that China can use solely in its own interest SEO platform for advancing its priorities, our strategic issues. Of course, it can declare its interest. It can propose some initiatives, ideas, but the consensus um, decision-making procedure makes it almost uh, impossible to advance this unilateral initiatives without agreement of other countries. And the, the best example can be the, uh, the initiative of China to establish some kind of uh, bank, some kind of bank with SEO bank to fund some projects within SEO. But this initiative was not warmly welcomed, let's say this way by Russia. And still we don't have such big funding uh, institution within SEO. And after the several attempts to build this institution within SEO, China made a decision to make something big even and establish this Asia Infrastructure Investments Bank, which is not linked to the SEO. Thank you so much. I think uh, Dr. Uh, Tolipo wanted to make a point. Then we'll come to Dr. Sriwastava. If we have time. Yeah, sure, sure, go ahead. Good. Um, regarding China, regarding uh, SEO, just a couple of words. Uh, I fully agree with uh, Akram when he uh, mentioned or touched the issue of uh, SEO being an anti-Western organization as uh, many observers and analysts uh, used to um, you know, believe uh, that it is uh, such kind of a, a unity, that such kind of body. It is uh, de facto, um, I would even better say de jure, uh, not an anti-Western, anti-US or anti-NATO uh, organization. Some people use even uh, Eastern NATO, the, the phrase Eastern NATO, that SEO is the Eastern NATO. Of course, it's not. Of course, it's not. De jure. Uh, the, their documents, their you know, declarations, uh, their charter, their SEO charter, it doesn't mention uh, any, any, any points uh, like this, that they, are, they stand against the West. But de facto, it's another aspect uh, because uh, it's not by accident that um, those the same observers, the same analysts, just uh, uh, you know, 
discovered this anti-Western uh, feature of the SEO. It's not just like fantasies, but uh, perhaps uh, some, some, uh, th there is some logic in such perception of the SEO. What kind of logic? You know, the uh, Russian Federation and uh, China, uh, two giants uh, within the SEO are by nature anti-Western countries. Maybe I exaggerate to some extent, but they are in opposition, let's say, uh, in a more subtle way, uh, in opposition uh, to United States, to the West in general. So uh, you can hardly say that Russia is a friend of the United States or China is a you know, brother of the United States. Of course, they are in opposition. They uh, are rivals uh, to the United States. This is axiomatic expression. But Central Asians are not. This is interesting paradox. Within the SEO, we have two giants who are in opposition to the United States and to the West, but other members of, uh, I mean, classical members, excepting so far India and Pakistan, I mean, Central Asian, uh, four Central Asian countries, they are not at all uh, rivals or critics or enemies of the United States. As I mentioned earlier, Uzbekistan has strategic partnership agreement with the United States. That's why uh, from this perspective, if some countries like Russia and China pursue uh, seemingly an anti-Western campaign within the SEO, be it in, term, in, form of, in the form of uh, declarations or documents or statements or so, so on and so on, they put uh, thereby Central Asians in perplexity, in perplex situation, how to react to such a, such a um, you know, motion uh, on the part of Russia and China within the same organizations. This is a uh, kind of seemingly, it's kind of a paradox to anti-Western, let's say, countries, Russia and China pursue uh, their um, anti-Western policy, others do not. So how to resolve this dilemma is an open question. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Kalikov, for your very informative response. Dr. Srivastava. Yeah, thank you. Uh, uh, all of your question was very pertinent, uh, but uh, I'll speak uh, um, on the last question that uh, the Chinese influence in Central Asia, this is very pertinent question. Uh, China has uh, the geographical proximity uh, with the uh, Central Asian countries, uh, the, the contiguity and the connectivity between uh, China and the Central Asian countries. Uh, through SCO, through SCO China, uh, um, I agree with the, um, uh, Dr. Talipov and the Akram, uh, through, on, in, uh, through the platform of SCO, China has not much gained in, uh, through the Central Asian countries, but the bilateral relation between the Central Asian uh, uh, country, uh, between the Central Asian countries and the China, uh, China has um, grown very much in uh, influence in the Kazakhstan, in Tajikistan. Um, uh, they have the China has uh, the energy thrust, uh, and China is uh, taking so much energy from the Central Asian countries. Um, China is uh, doing uh, a large amount of business in the Central Asian countries. Uh, so um, China has influence in the Central Asian countries uh, through SEO. Uh, uh, I'm agree with the, my co-panelists through SEO. Uh, uh, the Chinese is not um, gaining uh, much, but through bilateral relations, through geographical proximity, they are uh, achieving their economic goals in the Central Asian countries. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, the anti-Western um, uh, bloc what uh, Dr. Talipov has mentioned, uh, that Russia, uh, earlier Russia and uh, China, both have, uh, uh, both are using the SEO platform as the anti-Western um, platform. Um, they are uh, trying to, uh, or the some scholars, I don't know, uh, the Russia or China, or not, or the some scholars earlier, in the early stage, they have mentioned that the, um, SEO is the reply of the eastward expansion of NATO. So uh, these were the uh, 
articles and these were the comments of ex uh, when experts came in the early stage but now th this discussion is not uh, uh, prominent in the academia um, mm. not through seo but through the bilateral uh, connectivity and this concern had raised by the central asian scholars not uh, outside uh, not the people from outside so this uh, uh, the chinese influence is growing in the central asian countries second uh, your the, the your second question was the connectivity point uh, um, 20 years the nstc nstc the north south transport corridor um, is, taking 20 years, the uh, PM Atal Bihari Vajpayee has started this uh, initiative and the TAPI, the Turkmenistan, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India pipeline is not finished yet. So um, there are some geographical reasons uh, this, uh, and the political reason also for, because of the bad connectivity uh, between two old uh, civilizations, between two old neighbors, between two old friends. Thank you. Thank you. I think there is one more question, and this will be the final question. Uh, what role will the Shanghai Cooperation Organization play in the post-COVID-19 period in the global politics? Uh, uh, Talipo, Dr. Talipo uh, will be the best for this question. I don't know why you think that I'm the best to answer this question. I think you are, the worst you are the one. Most clear, the professor, uh, uh, I have listened to you in um, uh, many times, and I, I have grown up with the with your writings, sir. Uh, I, I have read many of your articles. <laughs> no, uh, I feel myself that I am in the worst, not best, position to uh, talk about post-COVID nineteen period in the global politics. I wrote a couple of articles on this right. It's it's okay, and uh, I also discussed this issue with my Central Asian colleagues uh, in a similar Zoom conference. Uh, and we uh, have uh, interesting uh, opinions. I mean, I collected uh, interesting opinions from my colleagues. Uh, and uh, just briefly, perhaps uh, I should say, uh, well, uh, I don't know if we have time. I, I, I would share another article of mine uh, just devoted to this uh, very issue, although it's in Russian, uh, not in English. Uh, in which I, um, you know, argue that, uh, first of all, uh, the post-COVID-19 uh, global world would not change dramatically. It will be, uh, in uh, most aspects, the same. Because the world at large had faced numerous pandemic-like situations in the past and uh, survived. And uh, we see uh, how we know from history that, uh, uh, you know, uh, the similar and even worse pandemics swept uh, across the uh, Eurasian continent, uh, by the way, along the Silk Road, ancient Silk Road, and targeted Europe. So uh, the uh, Europe survived and uh, the population of continent survived and we live today. I think we will overcome the hardships of uh, COVID-19, inshallah. We will uh, um, overcome and uh, so situation will return to the normal and the world will continue the life as it has before COVID-19. Um, regarding the SEO, I think uh, it depends on uh, which aspects uh, we talk about. Uh, when we say the role of the SEO in post-COVID-19. Because uh, I think for, for me, for me, uh, if, if, if we focus on Central Asia in our region, uh, not so much SEO uh, as the regional format itself will be more important to uh, develop um, relations, taking the lessons of the pandemic. I mean, um, we Central Asians, five Central Asian countries uh, should take right lesson uh, <clears throat> from this period, from this period. And uh, this, uh, the, one of the lessons of uh, the pandemic, which we 
uh, you know, experience today is that Central Asian countries should open to each other more and cooperate with each other more, including including uh, the sphere of reaction or reacting to critical situations, extraordinary situations like pandemic. In case of future pandemic situations, Central Asians uh, should be better prepared, better prepared to react to such situations. Not least because, not least because the cooperation in such situations is much cheaper uh, when uh, the cooperating sides are closer to each other. We are neighboring countries and uh, uh, we, we have the shortest distance, distances uh, between capitals and uh, we can easier help each other. So add to this also uh, the another factor uh, that we are not simply just neighbors. We are brethren. We are countries which declared integration in 1991. So this is a region in itself, region in itself. So regional format should be strengthened and, um, you know, uh, and taking into account possible, uh, I hope, uh, impossible uh, future uh, pandemic situations and uh, Central Asians can, should approach to such uh, undesirable future better prepared. SEO, I don't know. Uh, it's hypothetical. I don't know whether SEO can uh, contribute to this uh, post-pandemic uh, preparedness. Um, we know that uh, the origin or this, uh, the, the, I would say, the root of uh, coronavirus was in China. And uh, this caused different perceptions, different reactions, even critical positions. And uh, some uh, global uh, transnational corporations uh, decided to withdraw their offices, uh, their, you know, um, companies from China. Um, this is also one of the lessons. And taking into account this uh, uh, unpleasant situation that the greatest companies, which were so far located in Chinese territory and now decide to withdraw and relocate their um, companies, their offices, uh, their production chains and lines uh, to, another, to other countries, other regions. So why not to Central Asia? We can raise uh, the question, uh, come to Central Asia. Central Asians are peaceful, Central Asians are friendly, hospitable, and uh, they badly need investments uh, to develop. So that's why uh, they can contribute to such uh, goals of Central Asians by relocating some of the chains, some of the production lines, offices in Central Asian territory. I don't know whether this, science, this sounds quite illusory, uh, fantastic or realistic, I don't know, but I think it's not without logic. Right. Okay. If, I if I... One, one short phrase, can I add? It's okay. I would like just say that considering the rec record number of infections we are now reg registering in different parts of the world, maybe it's slightly early to talk about the post COVID world we are still in the covid world and uh, how seo the role of seo in post covid world will be shaped uh, by the way how seo will respond in in uh, multilaterally to this uh, challenge uh, in cooperation with between the seo member states now now we can say that there is a cooperation but it's mostly, it mostly have bilateral nature and we cannot see this uh, multilateral cooperation and coordination between SEO member states. Maybe this can be, as, as Dr. Talipov mentioned, a very good lesson for SEO to think more about this proper coordination and better preparedness for such uh, pandemic and uh, emergency situations in future. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, uh, Rahmat Aziz Chiterok Chalar. Thanks, our uh, dear Uzbekistan and uh, Indian experts. And uh, also, I would like uh, to ask the question re regarding bilateral uh, image of Uzbekistan in India, of India in Uzbekistan, as far as our today's session is uh, 
mainly on the bilateral relations uh, between Uzbekistan and India. And we all know that uh, due to common history and due to common cultural heritage since times of Tamerlan and Babur, uh, two countries have strong relations. And would you agree, I would like to uh, ask our Uzbekistan uh, colleagues, would you agree that India has positive image due to cultural heritage and due to current political agenda and also I would like uh, to ask uh, uh, Professor uh, uh, Shrivastava what is the image of Uzbekistan uh, in India? Thanks a lot. So uh, it seems that it's my turn to answer first. Uh, I think India has very positive image in Central Asia. It's mostly based on this, uh, as you mentioned, the heritage and history of our relations. And uh, the, the leading role of in, in forming this very positive image is also, um, is, is also as, as a role of Indian cinema properly. It's very popular in Central Asia, especially maybe in, in Uzbekistan. So uh, India has a natural kind of this advantage in, uh, in, in, in Central Asia, and especially in Uzbekistan, by having very positive image. And uh, the, the increasing of economic cooperation can only strengthen this, um, this, uh, this, this advantage. And so of course, we shouldn't uh, just uh, talk and we shouldn't be based only on this heritage and culture and our historical links, but we also should work more on our future and build more links, as you mentioned very rightly, on, on the people-to-people -people context, use-to-use -use, uh, relations and the science, uh, scientific circles cooperation and that, that, et cetera, it's in, in spheres of arts and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Um, you know, uh, I would just say perhaps one sentence. I miss Jawaharlal Nehru University, which I used to visit several times. I enjoyed my time in the JNU. Uh, I participated in a number of conferences and even spent one month by giving lectures uh, for students of the JNU. So I enjoyed, I love uh, JNU and I miss and hope for some cooperation with uh, JNU and other think tanks and uh, institutions like IDSA, for instance, from New Delhi. Uh, let me also uh, share with you very, very briefly a story like this. Uh, you know, in uh, the beginning of 2000s, in 1990s, uh, you know, the air flight from Tashkent to Delhi was half empty. As I said, I visited Delhi many times, Mumbai and other cities. So the, uh, I was uh, just one of just a few passengers on board uh, and there were several Indians flying from Tashkent to uh, Delhi, by the way, on the way from Europe. They were just transit passengers. And there were just a few passengers from Uzbekistan flying to Delhi. It was the case in 1990s and early 2000s. You know what is the case right now? It's over, you know, um, filled, I mean, uh, the board is full of passengers uh, and passengers from Uzbekistan. Most of them, let me tell you, most of them are going to India uh, in search for medical service, for pharmaceuticals. Uh, there is a long line uh, at the embassy of India in Tashkent uh, of uh, those citizens of Uzbekistan who are applying for visa, for Indian visa, and uh, they hope to go to India and uh, find uh, best treatment of their diseases. They take their relatives, their parents and grandparents to India uh, because they are convinced right now that India provides best medicine and pharmaceuticals for them. So that's why uh, there is a long queue at the embassy and uh, the huge wave of uh, visitors uh, from Uzbekistan to India, okay. Thanks a lot. 
And as for medical tourism, and now the same situation about India is with Turkmenistan also, if people used to, to come to Russia for medical treatment, that now they're coming to India. So the pain is in this fear now currently. Mm -hmm. And also I would like to ask uh, Dr. Srivastava regarding uh, the perception of Uzbekistan in India. Would you please answer? Uh, sorry, uh, I don't know why there was some technical problem. Uh, I didn't listen anything in between last five minute discussion. Uh, just I want to add uh, one footnote, uh, what the question was, uh, the, the Chinese intervention in um, Central Asia, a few days uh, uh, of, uh, in last month in, on 16th July, China has started a narrow discussion, five plus one dialogue. Um, uh, uh, but now uh, ex China has excluded uh, Russia, China has excluded India and Pakistan, and they've started the dialogue with the all Central Asian countries and plus China. So this is also a significant step taken by uh, China to make a more strong uh, um, presence in the Central Asian countries. Uh, what uh, Dr. Anna um, has asked about the India-Uzbekistan um, relation, uh, as uh, I have listened, uh, am I correct, Dr. Anna? Yes, we can hear you, Dr. Shivasawa, yes. Okay, 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 thank you. So uh, India and Uzbekistan, as uh, I have mentioned in my uh, presentation also, um, we have a very um, old relation, um, the century old relation we have, and we have the very common, um, we have shared past. So there's no any difficulty to uh, grow our uh, relation in the modern time um, between India and Uzbekistan, we have uh, many common uh, problems and uh, common challenges, and we can build our common future together um, in the field of technology, in the field of uh, small and medium scale industry, in the field of uh, tourism, tourism, because India, uh, India has, India and Uzbekistan both has a close connection between um, many cities. Uh, we can also start a um, uh, city, city uh, sister project, uh, which uh, domestically Indian Prime Minister has started uh, two cities from two different states. So we can start uh, two um, cities uh, between two different countries like India and Uzbekistan. We can, uh, we can uh, join um, uh, Agra to Samarkand or, Ag uh, or Delhi to um, any uh, task and these uh, two uh, sister cities connection. So, uh, and we can um, recently uh, um, in Tashkan, they have uh, uh, organized a Silk Route um, Festival uh, where uh, uh, more than 300 Indian uh, professors, academicians, and civil society members have invited there to take participate uh, in the Silk Route uh, initiative. So these are the uh, cultural aspects. These are the public diplomacy uh, uh, point of view. We can uh, in we can invest more uh, money and emotions to build our relationship uh, um, at uh, next level. Thank you. And if I have the honor. The possibility I would like to ask uh, His Excellency Ambassador regarding bilateral ties of uh, Uzbekistan and India. Your Excellency, uh, I'm sorry, can we hear you? Mr. Dilshot. Oh, sorry, dear participants, His Excellency is left uh, the session for some urgent phone call. We really apologize. Oh. So we, we will, I hope you'll have some time to discuss this again. Yes, thanks a lot. And uh, th thanks a lot. Uh, and now I would like to ask our experts uh, uh, 
how do you think would you agree that in uh, COVID uh, times the motives uh, of national interests prevail and uh, do you think that here there are wide prospects for cooperation between uh, Uzbekistan and India so will something uh, be done in the sphere of humanitarian cooperation between India and Uzbekistan I think uh, the uh, national interest perspective uh, always prevail in such situations, in similar situations. Take, for instance, Europe. Uh, although they are uh, heavily integrated uh, for decades, since 1949, approximately up to now. Today, uh, some uh, scholars studying Europe, European process, European unification, criticize Europe, Europeans, for their isolation from each other from uh, their distancing from each other. They're closing their borders and take measures against COVID on their own. And uh, they are less cooperative in this sense, they say. Why other countries should be different? For instance, our countries, Central Asians or Russia or whoever. This is pandemic. Of course, uh, in such extraordinary situation, uh, very dangerous situation, distancing is so natural. It's not by accident that uh, the, uh, in the lexicon we today uh, use very often the uh, word combination social distancing, right? We are trying to, to keep distance from each other. I mean, one human from another one. Uh, so if on the social level, we even we keep distance from our relatives, from our parents, our propaganda, our television and other media always reiterates, and we see this on the screen of TV, that even do not visit their parents if you love them, because you uh, put them on risk, because coronavirus doesn't make difference whether they are your parents or not. You don't put them on risk, so keep social distance. So social distance is natural, understandable, although uh, it isolates even relatives from each other. Why states should not isolate from isolate themselves from, uh, from others. So social distance, you can paraphrase social distancing into the language of politics by saying political distance. And uh, countries, if the countries isolate themselves relatively to some extent from others, it should be understood correctly without some bias interpretation. It's a temporary measure. We can even by isolating from, I mean, from Kyrgyz or from Kazakhs or from Indians, even preserve them from risks, I think. So that's why uh, political distancing of one country from another one is also so natural. We should understand this. But this logic a little bit contradicts to the logic of cooperation in such cases that countries should help each other, provide humanitarian assistance, for instance, Uzbekistan provided uh, huge assistance to neighboring countries, to Kyrgyzstan, Tajikistan, by sending uh, humanitarian goods, um, medical equipment, masks, and other things. So this is a little bit, uh, you know, controversial situation. We should isolate themselves. It is so natural. At the same time, we should cooperate. We never faced such situation uh, in our century, in our generation's life that we one day would face such a uh, unexpected, sudden, uh, tragic situation like pandemic. But anyway, this is a case for taking lessons, taking lessons for the future similar cases. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Now I would like uh, to give uh, the floor for one minute to every speaker, speaker for closing remarks, if you'd like to. to sum it up. May I, again? Yeah, sure. <laughs> yes, brief, as you said, uh, last remark. You know, again, about strategic partnership. This was my topic today. And uh, uh, none of the uh, strategic partnership agreements, uh, I mean, the texts uh, of signed by Uzbekistan with other countries, so with the great powers, none of them mentions terrorism and Afghanistan. Only our strategic partnership 
joint statement with India mentions this. This is, I think, illustrative, symptomatic, and promising. Our strategic partnership with America is different, with Russia is different, none of them with China is also different, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, none of them mentions uh, with, this, with such a focused manner situation in Afghanistan, uh, need to cooperate in fighting terrorism, but our strategic partnership uh, declaration with India contains such a message. I think this is very important to build on. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Rahman. Oh. Very briefly, I would like to say that, <clears throat> of course, national interests are always dominant, but at the same time, the cooperation with others can be also within our national interests. And pandemic again demonstrates, yes, at the beginning there was kind of chaos and there was unclarity about what is it, what it is and how we should respond to this. But then we, it, it, were, it, became, it, become, it, it has become more and more obvious that we should, be, uh, we should work together and cooperate more in order to respond properly to this crisis. Thank you. Rahmat. So if I may, Ms. Anna. Yes, yes, for so, sure. dear Anna and dear participants, on behalf of Ambassador, the Mr. Chatakhatov, I really uh, appreciate, we really express our gratitude for organizing for your meaningful and informative ideas on India-Uzbekistan partnership. And we believe we, the partnership between Uzbekistan and India, bilateral partnership between Uzbekistan and India on, in all spheres will continue to grow. And within the framework of SEO, our partnership will grow and we continue to support each other. Uzbekistan and India, India will support each other always. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your organizing this informative session. Rahmat, uh, it's a great honor for us uh, to see two Uzbekistan diplomats uh, today with Tilatoma Foundation and to all our international audience. And uh, thanks a lot uh, for His Excellency Ambassador for giving uh, his speech to our presenters, to our viewers, because thanks to it, we have heard, uh, had the most up-to-date information regarding bilateral uh, relations that we cannot now find in mass media as far as no official, there are no currently official visits due to the situation. So it's a great honor for us and thanks a lot, Rahmat. Thank you, thank you for organizing. And we, we hope to cooperate, to continue our cooperation with Tilatoma Foundation, even with a wider range, with the involvement of more audience, more participants in the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. much. And thank Uzbekistan you. is very rich in the most uh, brilliant scholars, diplomats, and practitioners in the sphere of international. Thank you. We really appreciate it. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. And uh, Bye -bye. also we have... Uh, yes, please. Yes, yes some floors. Also, Dr. Uh, Srivastava, please. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, I, I can say this uh, corona has... Uh, teach us to meet on the uh, digital platform. Before uh, Corona, we have not uh, thought that we will, and, uh, I can meet uh, Dr. Talipo on Zoom. So this is an uh, opportunity for me. And I, I must thank Tilotama Foundation for providing me this opportunity. Uh, because I have done my PhD on Central Asia. So I, I have read many articles of uh, Dr. Talipo. And my, uh, number, my final words is that India needs to come up uh, with the own connectivity projects along with the economic and strategic partnership with the all Central Asian countries. As I have mentioned, that the China on 16 July, China has uh, started another uh, level of engagement with the Central Asian countries, um, the five plus one. And the emerging geopolitical situation require India and Uzbekistan in context of Afghanistan. Uh, to restructure their relations along with their respective roles in the Central Asian region. Uh, India, Uzbekistan relations have significant potential, uh, 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 significant potential and 
uh, the both countries are seeking to address by the diversifying their cooperation um, as India seeks to increase its engagement with all Central Asian countries, Uzbekistan uh, is the key partner and it will um, open the gate uh, for India in the Central Asia. Thank you. Namaste. Spasiba. Spasiba. And also, I would like now to give the floor to Mr. Suham Das, director of Chilatoma Foundation. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna Valikaya. I will deliver the vote of for geopolitics and involvement in problems of the Republic of Uzbekistan. We also discussed a lot about the amazing potential between India and Uzbekistan, and especially the India-Uzbekistan strategic partnership. I want to sincerely thank Executive Dilshok Akatov, Ambassador Extraordinary and Plenipotentiary of Uzbekistan to India, participation of the I also to thank the Embassy of Uzbekistan in India. We look forward to greater partnership in times to come. I must thank the Foundation, Ms. Polami Bhattacharya, and Dr. Anna Valekaya, Honorary Convener and Advisor for Russian and Central Asian Affairs, Silatma Foundation, for their contribution. I also thank the speaker, Dr. Akram Umarov, Dr. Farhad Tolipov, and thank you all. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you.